We all want to make a positive impact on the world, but what do we have to experience to get there? This is Stripped Bear FM, where our shared stories of strategy, raw talk, and real people uplift and inspire you. Now, welcome the host of Stripped Bear FM, Catherine Contos. Hello, everyone. If you love the feeling of adrenaline, then today's show will get you up and roaring like an engine firing along a racetrack. Today on Strip Bear FM, we have the pleasure of talking to Carol Carpenter, a stunt performer and the track day owner of Moto Vixens located in Seattle, Washington. I would like to take a moment to ask my listeners to subscribe to CatherineContos.com to get the latest details on my podcast, retreats, blogs, and more. Now back to our guest. Welcome, Carol. Are you ready for some raw talk? Well, hell yeah. (laughs) Great. (laughs) That's exactly what I want to hear. (laughs) (laughs) Let's dive deep and let us in on the what's, the who's, and the how's on what made you the person you are today. Tell us a little bit about you before you became this great entrepreneur and began living your best life. Well, I, I, this was not something that was planned. It was never part of my, you know, mission ever to run a track day organization. I mean, I originally went to school for pre-med, so I thought I was going to be a doctor. There was nothing in, in my life that would have ever directed me into this profession or industry. So it's, it's definitely been an interesting journey. I'm a, most people know I'm Asian. So Obviously, I'm an American born Chinese and I was one I was actually the eldest in our family and um, my mother is also the eldest. So I think there's a little bit of this, I don't know, like caretaking thing that goes on because you kind of got to hurt all the kitty cats in your family and keep everybody in line. So I think I always knew I was going to do something to help others, but uh you know, I'm part of this Asian family. So it's my duty to become a doctor. And if you're not a doctor, you should be an attorney. So my original plan was actually to be a doctor, believe it or not. Okay. So this is a big difference between a doctor and a motorcycle rider racer. Yeah, I would say it's (laughs) probably on the opposite end of the spectrum. (laughs) So what happened in that, you know, in those first few years of your career, you went to med school? I did. Uh, I ended up taking pre-med. My mother was diagnosed with cancer, which I think kind of uh, made me even more determined to be a doctor because I wanted to be a part of being able to help her diagnose it, to help cure her for it if I could. You know, it was really important to me. But in the process, when she got diagnosed, she ended up having uh, surgery on her lung. She actually had lung cancer. Okay. Sorry to hear that. Oh, thanks. She's pretty brave. I mean, she was raising uh, my brother and I by ourselves. My parents got divorced when we were really young. So I, I really believe cancer, it's stress related. And I think women tend to carry stress a lot more than men. And uh, she, she was carrying the stress of basically coming from Taiwan, not speaking English, divorcing my dad, and then trying to make a living and raise two children. And I think that was a great deal of stress on her. And she ended up, you know, having this cancer and it was lung cancer, which is strange because she never smoked. So it goes to show you the cancer you get doesn't necessarily coincide with um, something that you did. It would be environmental. So I was originally set to go to pre-med and it was, it was probably about mid year when I went in for my pap. And the worst part was finding out that I ended up having like a stage four cervical three areas, I believe on my cervix that um, had tumors that were going to be required to be removed. So again, the fear of cancer, the big C and my mom. And I'm just thinking, oh my God, I'm how old? I'm not even starting my life yet. And I might have a pretty quick end to my life in the next few years, you know? 
And I watched my mother go through cancer and it was nothing pretty. And she was no longer the person she once was, the vibrant, vivacious, energetic. She was a, our caretaker and she loved and took care of every single kid that we brought home. I mean, our friends love coming to our house because she fed the freaking neighborhood. It was really difficult. So you, you get diagnosed with cancer while your mom is going through cancer. Is that correct? Oh, we were. Yeah, it was horrible. That must have been a nightmare. I can imagine how scared you must have been looking at your mom going through this. And now you're 18 years old. You're about to fly off, right? This is your time where you go from teenager to adult. And this huge trauma is happening to your mom. And then you get it as well. I can't imagine how you must have felt as a child and your mom being able to watching you and seeing you going through what she's going through. Yeah, it was really devastating. I mean, anybody that's young, that thinks their life is ahead of them, and they have all this time in the world. You know what, if you have a dream of doing something, do it because you just never know. It was a moment for me to completely change the way I felt about my trajectory in life too, because while I was there, I was also thinking, do I really want to be a doctor? Because that wasn't my dream. That was my mother's dream. And that there was a lot of factors that went into how my life changed for the future. So what happened in the next few years? When did you start writing? Like when did that, when did that shift happen? Oh gosh. Um, so after that, then I continued obviously working. I ended up uh, changing my major from pre-med. My mother and I had a long talk about this, but after she passed away, because I had always told her the only reason I did it was because I wanted to make her proud. And I think we all want to make our parents proud. And I was the eldest on my side. The family is also female. So being a female in the Asian culture is pretty difficult. But when you're the eldest, it's actually frowned upon. If I had been born in Taiwan or China, and it's kind of that ugly little secret in Asia is if you're the eldest female, most of the time you were left to either die or be given to another family and eventually be enslaved or, you know, be a help to that family. So I was born in, I was born in Los Angeles. So they obviously can't do that. I, I would say it's probably frowned upon. <laughs> to do that in America. So I experienced um, a discrimination based on my gender just within my own culture. Right. That's horrible. Yeah. It, it It's definitely been, it, it's also changed me because I watched my brother who was 18 months um, younger than me get treated like a little prince. Meanwhile, if anything went wrong, it was my fault. So it's an interesting way to grow up, for sure. And I was, an, I was about as American as you could imagine. You know, I'm born in Los Angeles. I'm being raised in Southern California. It's, it's not the same thing when you hear about stuff. And my grandmother used to tell me stories and just say, my God, I'm so thankful you were born in the States. I'm thankful, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Thank, thank God you were born in the States and you didn't have to go through what you would normally go through in China or in Taiwan. Yeah. It, it's still an ugly secret. And I don't know if the practice has been stopped. I think it's just one of those things that people just don't talk about. Yeah. So that does change you and mold you into the person that you are today. Definitely. Did it motivate you or did it hurt you? I think it did both. I mean, I don't think anything like that it, being that discriminatory, you know, towards little girls or, or females can't change you. It has to. I think, too, it probably made me want to work harder, strive harder, be successful, because it wasn't about being a female. And, and the one thing I never understood was the males never came back and really took care of the family members. If you ask my grandmother, my grandmother was like, we should be revering the girls because they come back and take care of the parents, not the sons. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but as I was working, my mother ended up 
passing, obviously from uh, the lung cancer that she had um, suffered with for years, she was she was terminal. I mean, it wasn't like we didn't know, mm-hmm. but I don't think there's ever a good time for a parent to pass. I think it's it's hard when your parent when you're young and your parents only holding on for you to get old enough to take care of yourself. So that was hard. How old were you when she passed? I was just shy of 20 years old. So I was 19, just about to turn 20. She passed. At 19, I was I was planning a funeral. Not something a 19-year-old should have to do. Yeah, that that was tough. That was definitely tough. You no longer have a safety net. And every choice that you make in your life is about survival. Mm -hmm. So did you live the next few years just in that survival mode? And how long did that last? No, actually, when I when I said my mother was hanging on for us to be able to be self-sufficient, I had a very steady job at that time. And I think that's what my mother was waiting for. I had a steady job. I worked for a high tech company. And I was going to school at night, so she knew I was okay. And there was several times that the hospital had called and said, you know, I think she's going to pass. And we would get there and, you know, she would be fine. And the one time that I got the call and I was unable to make it because my work required me to be there um, was actually, it was awful. It was actually the time she passed. So sorry you had to go through all that at such a young age. Like I said, though, everything happens for a reason. Right. And I do believe that she held on long enough to make sure that we were fine. Because if you look at my brother and I today, we're both very strong, driven individuals. But we all have really good hearts because my mother was such a great person. And she instilled that in us. Well, she should be very proud of you because you are a a hugely successful woman today running your own business. Oh, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So let's fast forward a little bit. You went through a few years of working, I'm assuming, different jobs. What what happened between the time your mom passed and then up until the time where your life shifted to living on your terms? After my mom passed, I was actually working at that job, the high tech job, which is where I met my um, now ex-husband and I married and had two children with. So I ended up working for FileNet for quite a while before I ended up marrying Lewis, my ex-husband, and had my two children. When I did that, I quit my job and I made the conscious effort. We actually talked about it because it was really important to us that somebody else didn't raise our children. And my sacrifice was, you know, I love my kids. I really want to be there for them. I want to instill the values and I want to be there for every step of the way, because my mother had to give that up in order to uh, provide for us. You know what I call a uh, stay at home mom, an operations manager. (laughs) (laughs) That's the truth. I mean, it is a, it is an exhausting job. And when they're young, I have never felt so dumb in my life because my language skills diminished greatly. (laughs) As you're just making cooing sounds and just, you know, basic talk with your children. And then you would try to have a conversation with your friends and you're like, oh my goodness, I have lost all the capacity to talk like a human being anymore. So that's what happened to me. (laughs) (laughs) Now I know. (laughs) Many years later. (laughs) Thank you for that. (laughs) Well, it's okay. We all, it's, what is it? Mommy brain fog and... Oh, there's all kinds of names for that. So you became a stay-at-home mom, a very big job, period. That's why I call it an operations manager. And then what happened after that? The children grew up. Chris, my eldest, decided to move out and live with his dad. And my youngest stayed with me, which meant, you know, I have more time. And going through the divorce, there's, you know, I mean, I'm not taking care of so many people. And I had a little bit of free time. And I also kind of lost my... I don't know. I, I, I guess I kind of lost my purpose because I had been such a busy mother between the two children and a wife. All of a sudden, it just came to this screeching halt. And I had one child in my home and I felt like I had no more purpose. 
and I didn't keep my skills up, so I couldn't just jump back into the workforce. Right, but th- this this is the situation where a lot of moms are left, and especially stay at home moms, where you know their th- the children are growing up, they become teenagers, and they decide to go back in the workforce, and they feel like they've lost their identity either because of the uh, children, the husband, or all of it combined. So what do you do when you're stripped bare of your, you know, who you were, your character, your personality, your loves, your passions? At that point, you have to shift the way you're thinking. How did you know what to do at that point to find who Carol was again? Trust me, it was not an epiphany at all. (laughs) I was just actually talking to a girlfriend and I said, I feel so worthless and I'm not sure what to do. And I have, you know, I have a little bit of time. Maybe I do. I start checking off bucket list things. I go, what is it you want to do? And we started talking about it. We went down this list of stuff. And for us, one of the very first things we wanted to do was I always wanted to ride a motorcycle. My brother rode when he was 18. He almost killed himself because, you know, boys do what boys do. But I was like, I want to try that. I always wanted to try it. Never got a chance to do it. I wanted to shoot guns, did that. I mean, there was a list of things I wanted to do. So I just started checking it off the, you know, bucket list. And I'm not writing, going and signing up for that class and writing and taking the endorsement class was probably one of the most terrifying things I had ever done in my life because I never drove a stick shift. I had no concept of gears. I had no concept of anything. And so sitting on a bike with controls on your hands and your feet and then trying to make sure everything were, it was just completely overwhelming but I ended up getting my endorsement and I started riding a little bit on the street and I soon discovered that when I'm doing this I'm by myself and when I'm by myself I can think And then it was, oh, I can actually be creative while I'm by myself. Because I, for years, you're, you know, when you're a mom, you're, it's constant noise, mom, 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 or, you know, phone calls or texts or whatever. But when you're on your bike, you put the helmet on, you can't take calls. I mean, you could, if you had a sunny unit, but you can't take calls. There's nothing for you to do except for concentrate on what you were doing. And that was so peaceful. And I think that's what connected me to that sport is it allowed me to find myself. The key thing to what you're saying right there right now, and people don't realize is you were being very mindful. It's an active meditation, what you're doing when you're writing. Yes. Yeah. Because you're literally in your own mind, right? You know, and you're also writing is also visceral. You don't have, when you're in a car, you're in a, we call it a cage. When you're on a bike, you feel the wind, you hear the noise. It is very visceral and it's, it's almost like you're reconnecting with nature too. So in a sense, yeah, it is a form of meditation. Right. People don't realize that. And where did it get from the point of I'm riding a bike to making this a business? Um, let's see. Cause I'm an idiot. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) I think, you know what, you have these fandangled ideas, you know, when you're writing and I had a, I'm a small person. I am five foot four. I've got small hands and small feet. Bikes aren't made for me. I was super frustrated in trying to find some way to make it more comfortable so that I could actually be confident on this bike. And all these bikes are too tall for me. The controls are too far for me. So I was lucky enough to be friends with the guys at Ducati Bellevue. And we talked a little bit about, you know, mods that I could do to the bike to help me be able to reach my levers, you know, easier, bring my foot pegs, you know, higher up and closer to me and says so far away, bring the, the levers on my shifters closer as well. I mean, everything was adaptable. I just didn't know about it because I figured you buy a bike and that's how you ride it. It was really uncomfortable. So when I went through all that, well, I know there's not very many women writers, but maybe the reason there aren't are because they don't know that how to make those changes to make it comfortable for you. 
And so I started my website as kind of an informational and resource site for women that, you know, were looking for gear or for education, for blogs, for whatever it may be that they needed to get some type of information for what they wanted. And it didn't start off very big. I mean, it, it just basically started off as a website. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. But the guys at Ducati Bellevue in 2013, I actually started the company in 2012 with no idea where it was going to go. By 2013, Ducati Bellevue, the, the general manager, Kevin Davis, uh, asked me to be their ambassador for women and gave me a session uh, within one of their dealer, uh, I guess you would call it a dealer track day. Um, and we filled it and the women loved it and they just wanted me to do it again. And so we, we did another one and it wasn't so great. And it, I think some women really loved the idea. Other women didn't love the idea. So we weren't really sure how to get more women involved. And it was kind of a test for us to see because men and women are different in the sport. Men are just kind of gung ho and they love the sport. And if they're in it, they're in it. They don't care. They just, they're in it. Women were a little bit more difficult for us to figure out. And we weren't sure if it was due to the fact that it was quote unquote, a track day. And that word in itself intimidated them. So you started a business with no business plan. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. With no business plan, just an idea of a you found a pain point, though, you found a pain point, And you just started your business, knowing that you weren't comfortable in doing this, and there must be others. Right. And in a very male dominant field. How yes. difficult was that? for you to break into this kind of field where even the equipment is made for men? Well, it's not easy. <laughs> Anybody that does motorcycles, I guess you'd call type A. And if you're going to do it, you have to have a thick skin because you're gonna fall. It's just inevitable. We always have a saying that it's not a matter of if you're going to crash, it's when you're going to crash. It is not as scary as it seems. And that's the reason why we're geared up as much as we are is, you know, it, everything we do is a learning experience. And I was so at that point, after doing all the stuff with Ducati Bellevue, I was so I wanted more. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to go be the best I could be. And so I ended up traveling to California and did a bunch of different, you know, uh, renowned track schools. And I came back and I was so comfortable on the street. I had learned so much. And the writing group that I rode with every weekend when I came back has said, oh, oh, my God, your writing's changed 100 percent. So I got addicted and I wanted more. And I started going to more days and learning more. And I, I honestly think with every school, every instructor, you learn or you hear a morsel of information that is so valuable. There's just never any really bad information. It's how you apply it. Because I don't think all information is going to be relevant to your style of writing. Because again, I'm small. What works for me will not work for a guy that's six foot two and like 230 pounds. So you take what works for you, you try it. Eh, that one doesn't work for me, toss it out the window, move on, right? But by the time I came back from all that training, I just needed more seat time. And so I ended up being an instructor for a bunch of different organizations up here, track day organizations. And I was probably one of maybe three female instructors up here. And I think I was at that point working for them, doing anywhere from 20 days out of like two months so we would be doing in a season 40 days at the track. So I had quite a bit of seat time racked up at that point. And I decided I wanted to be a novice racer and challenge myself to get my expert license so that, I don't know, I, I wasn't planning on going and becoming a 
national racer. I just think I wanted to set goals that for myself that I could reach. And that was my next step. So you found your passion. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was addictive. We all, there's a saying about riding motorcycles. We say, if you teach your children, the passion of motorcycles will never have enough money for drugs or alcohol. (laughs) Uh, it's it's not uh, it's not an inexpensive sport, but it's definitely not as expensive as cars. Cars are a whole different category for expenses. What was the biggest struggle growing your business at this point? The biggest struggle for me was I had worked as an instructor for the organizations that I was now competing against. And when I decided to do my track days, I don't think they liked the fact that I was now their competition and they're all run by men and it's a small pool. They made it extremely difficult for me to break in even in their so-called little boys club. They had threatened their instructors, marshals, staff that if they came to work for me at any point in time, meaning even on one day, and they found out that they were no longer allowed to work for their organization. So as you can imagine, I was no longer working for them. And they were putting these mandates out on their, on their staff. So it made it really hard the first couple of years to get the staff that I really wanted. But as the way most ultimatums go, eventually people just started saying, F you, I'm not doing this. And I actually got a staff that I really wanted. The people that I did want started just drifting over. Amazing. And how big is your business today? After all, how many years now? It's been since 2012. So after eight years, where are you at today with your business? Oh my gosh, it's not in a million years, Catherine, could I have ever imagined I'd be where I am today. Okay. So as women, we're, we love, we love taking care of people, right? And it's always about giving back in any way you can get back. And I always said to myself, if I made a business that was successful in this industry, I would find ways to give back. And the way we give back is through uh, sponsorship. And we take the proceeds that we make on our track days and we put them out towards, you know, supporting our race organization, which is where I learned to race. And I, I raced for quite a long time. And that's with uh, Wormra, Washington Motorcycle Road Racing Association. And so I sponsor them. I sponsor a female racer in Moto America. Her name is Caroline Olson and she's from Norway. I sponsor Oliver Jervis, who's from Canada, and he raced Omra. Oh, yeah, Canadian. (laughs) And then we also do Jeremy Coffey. He's kind of a local uh, boy in our area, and he's number 42, and he he races. He's going to be racing Superbike in Moto America this year. So for us, it was important to continue to promote the sport and grow it because our sport, I think, is fairly obscure. I don't think most people know about it until you talk about it and they find it interesting, but it's not like, uh, when you mention formula one, everybody knows what formula one is. When you mention road racing, they're like, but what's that? You know? And then once you explain it, they get interested, but it's not a mainstream sport. It's almost like you have to get in. It's like a club, you know, it's like you have to get introduced into it to, kind of fall in love with it because you don't even know it's there. So how many track days do you have now? This year, we're going to be doing 10. I fight for my schedule a year ahead of time. Oh, is that how it works? Okay. Oh, yeah. And it is, I mean, you fight. You fight for your dates. Like you, you'll submit your dates as a first, second, and third option. And then they want backups to those. Honestly, you don't get what you always want, you know, want deep down inside, but you get something and you just live with it. And then you plan again for next year. For us, we have 
since we have Jason and his schedule so limited uh, because he travels quite a bit and he does Moto America, he announces for Moto America, we have to, when we're picking our dates, we almost have to fudge it a little bit knowing what Moto America dates might possibly be for next year. So it's a guess. Amazing. So you basically went from dropping out of med school because you realized it wasn't your dream to becoming a full-time mom, an operations manager, like I said. (laughs) And then when the children were teenagers and you felt lost and didn't no longer knew what your purpose was, no longer knew what Carol loved, you decided to create a bucket list. And lucky for you, the first thing on the list ended up becoming not only your passion, but your business that is thriving today. Wow. That, that is exactly what happened. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on that, Carol, because that's quite the story. Yeah. Well, you know, it goes to show you opportunity, you know, never, never turn from it because you never know where it can take you. For me, it's been an adventure. Yeah. And I tell my clients, you know, a lot of people do lose their passion and they don't know where to look for it or how to find it. And I'm like, well, you need to go out there and try stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's funny because they sit there and they say they have to find it. And I find a lot of times it was already introduced to them and they weren't paying attention. Exactly. So Carol, I know my listeners will love to know even more about you and your strategies on how you made it. So let's take a quick peek and fast track (laughs) through some questions. Are you ready? Oh, God, yes. Okay, so quick (laughs) quick answers, okay? Okay. So what was the one thing holding you back from making the jump to living your best life on your terms? Fear. What is the one thing you are most excited about today? My future plans. Share with us your one personal habit that make you successful and keeps you inspired. Daily exercise. What book would you recommend to our Strip Bear listeners and why? Any Dr. Seuss book. Really? (laughs) I'll tell you why. Because it reminds you to focus on your inner child when you had no inhibitions or fear. Because fear is taught and learned. And I want people to remember that being fearless is what we were all meant to be. And you got to You got to connect with that. I think we're all too scared. Yeah. Fear is a big one. Fear is a big, the biggest obstacle that everybody faces on their daily basis and on their dreams. And that's often what kills their dreams. So yes, absolutely. So now for our soul shaker question, if you woke up tomorrow and you were stripped bare of everything in your business and only had shelter, food, and your family, what would be the first things you would do in the next 30 days with only $500 in the bank? Just enjoy my family. That's time you will never get back. And then, you know, once, once you have what you need from that, it'll fuel you to take that time to, like you said, meditate, right? And assess what's important and then set a new goal and achieve it. And not let fear stop you. Nope. No, I think we're going to beat fear down with a stick. Carol, on a last and final note, what's the one takeaway message my listeners need to hear today? It's never too late. How old were you when you started this business? Oh my God. 42. Amazing. Congratulations, Carol. (laughs) Thank you. Tell me, Carol, what's the best way to connect with you? Uh, you can connect with me on Instagram and Facebook under Moto Vixens or on LinkedIn as Carol Carpenter. I also have a website. Uh, it's www.motovixens.com. You can connect with me there. There is a con- uh, contact us button on there as well. And you told me you have something, a little giveaway for our listeners today. We do. I do have some Moto Vixens collection apparel. And for anybody listening today, we'd like to offer 15% off. And our discount code will be stripped bear 15. And just put that into the discount code. And whatever you order, it'll take 
they'll take the percentage off. Carol, thank you so much for sharing with us your stripped bear story today. Thank you, Catherine. That's all for this episode of Stripped Bear FM. Start living your best life. Head to katherinecontos.com for more information and resources, as well as ways to connect with Catherine directly. That's available exclusively on Catherine with a C, K-O-N-T-O-S dot com.